2019 for me has been one of the hardest years that I've ever had to deal with from having to make a decision to leave a toxic relationship, move across the country where I have no family, and um, coming close to being homeless, and just thinking that I'm not worthy of happiness or his love, to coming and finding life point where I have integrated myself and found friends and people who have become like family that are showing me love and coming closer to him, to God, where if you asked me a year ago today, I never would have thought that I can be as fulfilled or overflowed with love and happiness as I am now. And I just want to let you guys know that there is hope. What's up, LifePoint? How you guys doing? Everybody excited? How many of you are glad that there is hope? Man, in today's world, it doesn't always feel like that, you know? It's a tough season, right? I, I don't know if this statistic is true or not. I've always heard it my whole life that there are more people who will end their life in this season than any other season during the year. Like I said, I'm not sure about the uh, accuracy of that statement. But I do know this, that this is a season if we're not careful, we'll leave some people out. And what I love about the gospel of Jesus Christ is it leaves no one out. It's inclusive. It's God came and he reached so far down in the depths of our world and he said, I want you. I want you. And he paid the ultimate price so that that could happen. And that means there's hope. There's hope for me. There's hope for you. There's hope for your family. There's hope for the people that don't even know about the hope yet. The ones that are stumbling around in, the, in this world lost and they feel like they're kicked out by society and outcast. There's hope for them that, that God can change their circumstance, that they can put their feet on solid ground, that they can move into a place where not just that they've experienced hope, but that they begin to actually then dispense hope through their life, that their life has been transformed. Because that's what's supposed to happen when your life is transformed. Then it's supposed to be a light for other people. And then they say, hey, hey, what happened to you? I remember you were going through some of the same struggles that I have. And, and now you seem to be pretty stable. What is that? And you get to say, hey, that's Jesus. I couldn't do it by myself. I couldn't get it all figured out. But he grabbed me. He loved me. There was mercy in his eyes. And he put my feet right on the solid rock. And he changed not some things, but everything in my life. And now I owe it all to him, right? Jesus paid it all. All to him I owe, right? That's the song, but it's more than a song. It's the reality of our lives. And there's a hope that, that should be ringing out of us as Christ followers. And yet I, I wonder about our society. When we were kids, somebody would say something and we would maybe be just to prove how honest we were being, we would say, cross my heart, hope to die, stick a needle in my eye, right? Then it got carried away, jab a dagger in my thigh, eat a horse manure pie, it went all the whole, whole, way, whole way down the line, right? But what that was saying is like, if, if I'm telling a lie, then, then I, maybe I should die, right? And there's actually a, a very long poem about that I was researching this week, but Aren't you so thankful that God never lied to you? Not once. Not once did he let anybody down on this earth. He's the one constant in life. And if we're not careful, we'll celebrate the one constant in life maybe once a month. Maybe once a week. That's not what he wants from us because real hope rings out of your life every single day and people, and people carry it forward all the time. And I know that we're in a society that, that talks about just stuff all the time. How many of you were here for Dr. Toke a couple weeks ago and he said how interesting it is that as soon as the new iPhone drops, 
I just don't feel happy with my phone anymore. You know what I mean? I'm like, oh, if I could just get the new phone, because that's the hope. It'll be a little bit faster, and the camera's better. And we start thinking that's going to that's gonna be the supply of my, my happiness. That's what's going to make me feel good about myself. And that's just not true, right? But we're living in a society where so many people have misplaced hope. If I could just get that job right there, if I could just, if they would just put my name on that corner office, or if I could get that boat, right, if I could get that car, if I could get that relationship, if that person would love me, then I would feel alive again, and that hope would really, no, that's misplaced, that, that hope that comes from this world is not real hope, and it will let you down again and again and again, and I don't want you to experience that again this season, so I know we're all looking for something to fill our hearts. That has to be the love of God. It has to be the power of the Holy Spirit, and if this hope that people have in the things of this world, if that's all you've got, you're miserable. You don't even know it. You don't even know it. I don't want that for you. Clive Staple Lewis said most people, if they had really learned to look into their own hearts, would know that they do want, and want acutely, something that cannot be had in this world. There are all sorts of things in this world that offer to give it to you, but they never quite keep their promise. Isn't it interesting how that happens? Like once again, a new iPhone, and then you realize the iPhone just sends texts and calls just like the last phone that I was hanging out here at the tree tent the other day. By the way, how many of you bought your tree? Mmm. Mm. That's why there's so many trees left. <laughs> I'm just picking. I know it's just the first, the first day of December. Let me tell you this. We have about 360 trees left. We brought in 900, so they're going fast. Yeah, that's good. Let's sell, sell those trees. Here's what I need from you. I need you to go buy a tree. If you can come and help load trees later, go home and change. That would be awesome too. Pay a lot for your tree that because 100% of the profit goes out to help kids globally and locally. And the last thing is when you're buying your tree, don't be so picky. <laughs> How many picky people we got in the house? <laughs> so I was out there the other day and it brought me back to this because I was out there and this guy wanted like this 14-foot tree. And uh, my man Curtis was over there. And thank God his sons were there, but they're not as strong as Curtis is, and they might be stronger than I am. But we were out there, and we lift this tree, and it was so heavy, and we're just holding it there. And I notice he's just, this guy is just taking his sweet time. It's a big tree. <laughs> so I said, hey, man, you got to hurry. And I kind of peeked around the branches, and I look, and he was trying to get his phone. He said, I got to take a picture, and he did like this. <laughs> yeah. You know what that is? That's a flip phone. It's like from 1987. It was a, the first model ever, Nokia. It was an incredible Motorola or something like that. And I heard it take the picture. He pressed it. <laughs> and I was like, oh my goodness. You know what I mean? And then we laid the tree down. And he said, just a few minutes, my wife will be here. She's going to want to see it again. I said, Lord Jesus, help me. I need your patience. <laughs> and he helped me through it, right? My hope isn't in a flip phone. It's not in a new iPhone. It's not in anything in this world. It's not in a 14-foot tree or zero tree. It's in a tree like that, that Jesus came and made a way that we could experience life and experience hope that would change our lives. And, 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 and everybody that's going after the stuff that, 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 that tries to fill them up, if you're, if you're not careful, you will chase that path and you will end up hopeless. So why is it that we're seeing people kill themselves? It seems like in record numbers. Once again, I don't know if it is. But usually even people in ministry. And I don't know if it's because we're attached to social media. We just see stuff quicker and more often than we used to see. But man, there, there, are, there are pastors. I mean, guys that are preaching hope or taking their lives. And, and people who have millions of dollars are taking their lives. They're just quitting over and over again because they have no expectation of good. Or hope for success, right, in their life. So they just quit. They just quit. I'm done. I don't want to do life anymore. And people are depressed and oppressed. They're on medication and therapy. And I'm not picking on anybody who, who is on this. I'm just saying I don't want you to live with extreme sadness or hopelessness or a lack of energy or irritability. And I know a lot of you are irritable. I won't ask you to raise your hand. But trouble, you got trouble concentrating and thinking. And you can't focus because it's just a chaos. You think that's why Jesus came? So that we would live like that? And December is like the worst of all. People going nuts. Black Friday. 
I won't ask you to <laughs> convict yourself if you went out there and invite the, I'm not doing that. I know, I know exactly, Amazon.com. <laughs> I got that sorted out a long time ago, right? Just, uh, just get more and more. Tell my daughter, just go just send me the list, right? Bink, done. Deliver it to the house. Maybe that's you. Maybe life has kicked you over and over again, but I, I, w- I want something better for you. That's why the Holy Spirit is here. If you've got your Bible, turn over to Romans chapter 5. See, if you're feeling hopeless, which some of you are, some of you came in that way today, that's okay. It's just not okay if you stay that way. Today is a day of hope where hope comes alive inside of you because hopelessness is an attack on the plan of God in your life. It's an attack on the plan. If he can get you to feel hopeless, if he can get you in a cycle of busyness, if the enemy can just take you and just get you over here and say, chase this path, and you chase that path again, you get down there and go, man, that path lead to nowhere. Also, why, am I keep, why do I keep doing this? And we just get so mixed up and we get so lost. That's not what God has for you. He has a plan, and there's a purpose inside the plan, and it's beautiful. The Apostle Paul was writing to the, the Romans when he said this. He said, therefore, since we have been made right in God's sight by faith, we have peace with God because of what Jesus Christ, our Lord, has done for us. Listen, it starts by getting right. It starts by getting right. Here's the deal. You can't get it right. What is it? It's, good, it's God's goodness that brings us to repentance, right? And here's Paul's line of thought. It's the Apostle Paul's line of thought is this, that he's actually laying out. It's kind of rigid, That there's a responsibility to being right. That we can't make ourselves right, but he makes us right. And then there's a responsibility to it. We call it justification. Justification. I tried to tell you guys this a few times this year because I want you to get it. And you might think that's an old church word, but just think about it like this. Just as if I've never sinned. That's how God makes you. When you say, God, will you take my heart? Will you take all the sin in my life? Will you take all the chaos? I give it to you. And he goes, I make it just as if you've never sinned. Jesus, will you be my Lord and Savior? Will you run the show? I just want to be on autopilot. I'm going to make you just as if you've never sinned. I'm going to make you right. And the justified person then has peace, right? Peace and joy. Those are the results of justification, of being right. But he doesn't quit there. This doesn't stop because we're full of love. We're full of peace. And this salvation moves forward. Okay, cool. I went to church. God saved my life. Had a great altar moment. Everything is good. I'm good. No, our our justification stands. It stands strong and hope comes alive. See, we win. That's when you start shifting, when you know you won. You watched the football games the other day, anybody? Thanksgiving Day. You always know the losing team at the end of the game because they've got their hands on their hips and their heads are down. Watch the national championship in just a few weeks. You'll see the guys like this. You know they lost. See, the confidence that we carry with us is not a confidence of us. It's a confidence of what God has done for my life. So I'm more confident than I've ever been. When I wake up in the morning, I'm like, man, somebody's about to get rocked with Jesus today. They don't even know it. I'll go to the restaurant. I'll order some pupusas and slap the gospel on somebody. They won't even know what happened. You know what I mean? (laughs) They won't even know. You know what I mean? This is how it's supposed to be. (laughs) Because this thing that's living inside of me is real. I know it's real. I feel it. Nobody can tell me any different. People call me crazy. I am crazy. You know what happens when you're young? You have to go through this process of trying to figure yourself out. And it's a brutal process. Middle school is horrible. Now, I remember just thinking, like, if I could just hang out with that guy right there. That guy. Man, he is so cool. Right? And then I actually got to hang out with that guy. You know what I found out? That dude was a dork. Seriously, he wasn't any cooler than me. He was just a person. And that's the deal is like we're all just people. And I don't care about rubbing elbows with this person or this person. I don't care about that. Who I care about rubbing elbows with is the Holy Spirit because he's the one who's changing me and shaping me and molding me and filling me and guiding me and comforting me. That's what I need in my life. But this repentance has to be in line with justification. I'm going to make you just as if you've never sinned, but I'm also going to set some responsibility on your life. What you do with justification is this, that you would continue to move towards me. And moving towards God is moving away from the old life that was there. My thoughts shouldn't be consumed by the things that don't give us peace and whole. 
money, time, housing, transportation, your spouse, your kids, all of those things are wonderful. There's nothing wrong with them by themselves, but they don't dispense hope like God does. Our God is greater than all that. In fact, he eclipses all of this. He breathes life into the earth. At, at his words, at his hand, the universe continues to operate, and the sun just stays just far enough away that we don't burn up, but also that we don't freeze, and the planets align, and the stars are beautiful, and the ocean's great, and it comes just to the shore, and we can go out and enjoy it, but it doesn't sweep over and kill us. God has his, his hand on us, and we would start trusting him, and we would start moving towards him, and it's not just a season where we make resolutions and say, okay, I went, man, we had a whole day of Thanksgiving. No, it's a whole life of Thanksgiving. Right? When we start living like that and believing that he's going to continue to move in me and that I can walk in him, then things shift in my life. Hope comes alive. Verse 2 says this, because our faith, Christ has brought us into the place of undeserved privilege where we now stand. And we confidently and joyfully look forward to sharing God's glory. Man, this is powerful. This is powerful that, that, that there's an emphasis here. There's an emphasis on the activity, the work of Christ. Not your work, the work of Christ. But because of our faith in this, that I actually believe that Jesus did something, that Christ has brought us into this place of undeserved privilege. And if you think you deserve it, you're wrong. I know there's this whole feeling in our society today of entitlement, like I deserve this, you owe me this. God doesn't owe you anything, right? But he came with mercy in his eyes. He came with, with his love in his eyes, and he said, I want you to come in there. So he's brought us, and we can confidently and joyfully look forward to sharing God's glory. We just sang this. Show us your glory. Show us your glory. And if we're not careful, we just sing these words out of our life, like today's the only day that he wants to show us his glory. It's every day, but we don't stop every day because we're, once again, we're too busy. We just, this cyclical behavior of like, I'm just going to press. I'm a worker bee. I'm just, I'm a workaholic. I'm going to get it done. I'm going to get all the money. I'm going to get all this. There's nothing wrong with working hard. I'm a hard worker too, but we've got to stop and we have to understand that the stress that, that we, we feel is put on by ourselves. Because God's already done all the work for us. And when we talk about this, this place, this rejoicing confidence, this, this thing that comes alive inside of us, that means a triumphant. That means we win, right? There's exaltation in the hope of the glory of God. And glory is deep. And glory is wonderful. And, it, and glory will change you, right? It's something so beautiful. But if we're left to ourselves to get this, no, it ain't going to work. The Bible's very clear about that. Even the unchurched people know that. For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. You think you're going to climb this mountain yourself? You're going to get there? I'll just walk right up in the presence of the glory of God. You're not going to get there. But he made it possible that we could stand there and experience it. It's says God prayed this. Jesus prayed this in John 17. He said, God, show them. Let them see your glory. Make them one and let them see your glory. That's what I love about this, that this fire is burning in, in some of you individually. And I see it more and more catching fire, right? And, and your fire catches with my fire and their fire. And next thing we got 100 fires and 1,000 fires. And next thing you know, South Florida is on fire with the gospel of Jesus Christ. It's possible and probable and should be through our church. Think about this. Stephen, they're stoning him. In the book of Acts, they're killing him with rocks. What does he look up and see? He sees the glory of God. Man, that's enough to carry you forward right there. He goes, man, well, this guy's stabbing me. In the He's talking about me. They're lying about me. They stole money from me. Yeah. Look up and see the glory of God. He's got you. People living without Christ grow increasingly hopeless. But as Christ followers, we can live with ongoing hope. Building hope. That means that I had some hope last year, but my hope is bigger this year. Some of you are like, okay, I've got a Lord, I've got a Savior. Yes, do you have expectation that he's going to do something ridiculous in your life? I'm serious. I already told you my confidence is higher than ever. I expect God to blow my mind every single day. I'm praying prayers that I've never prayed before. People ask me, like, well, I got some friends that, you know, pastors always talking about, 
you know, this number, that number. And listen, people are numbers. Everyone matters. Every number matters because it's a soul, right? And we should do this. But I don't want, I don't want to just have, oh, man, we want to reach 2,000, 3,000 people in Homestead. We want to reach all of Homestead with the gospel of Jesus Christ. I believe that's possible. I believe that it's possible. Some of you say, that's, well, that's crazy. Yeah, I'm not, I don't want to have a church of 1,000, 2,000 people. I want to have a church of 100,000 people. That's big, but it's possible because God did it. He took, he took 12 people, and he just tapped in, and he said he showed them his love, and, and that love has continued on, and I know you experienced that love, and they're there, and you went out and changed the world, and they changed the world. That can happen, and God is doing that in this next season, so you better hang on tight. Hang on tight because it's happening. Verse 3 says this, we can rejoice too when we run into problems and trials for we know that they help us develop endurance. Well, nobody wants that. The book of James, he writes, dear brothers and sisters, when troubles of any kind come your way, consider it an opportunity for great joy. Well, I don't want any trouble. I don't want any trouble in my life. For you know when your faith is tested, your endurance has a chance to grow. So let it grow. For when your endurance is fully developed, you will be perfect and complete, needing nothing. See, there's something about the trial that proves something. There's something about building of the character there. Paul, Paul wrote, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me, right? Philippians 4.13. Everybody quotes that, but they use it out of context. You think he was talking about football? Or you can take a test, right? Some of the students out there, test-taking season. They haven't studied for anything, but they're like, God, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. Bring back to my memory anything I haven't studied, everything I thought I might want to study someday. Just bring it all back to me, God. Listen, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. That's not what he's talking about. What he's talking about is that you can be tired and cold and shipwrecked and hungry. People be lying about you. Your car might be leaking oil. Your roof might be leaking. But you can be content. I can be content. I can be happy. I can have joy no matter what comes my way. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. The old hymn, Great is Thy Faithfulness, right in that last line, the last stanza, he says, Strength for today and bright hope for tomorrow. Strength for today, bright hope for tomorrow. How many need strength today? Yeah. I'm not talking about just for the trees out there. I'm talking about, I need strength today. I need, strength. I, need, I need him to touch my life. I need the power of the Holy Spirit to move in me because if I'm in control of this thing, we're all in trouble. I need him to guide and direct me, but not just the strength to live today. Not just enough to muster up to get my head off the pillow today. Not just enough to get that I could just take a step. Not just that, but also hope for tomorrow. That's the expectation because God is a God of more, right? He's, got a God, he's, got, he's a God of a plan and a purpose inside of that plan for your life. So you would wake up and say, yes, I have the strength today. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. I am content in whatever he has my way. But I know that he's got a plan for tomorrow and it's bigger than anything we can imagine, anything we could dream up ourselves. He wants to move in a mighty, mighty way in our lives. Strength for today, bright hope for tomorrow. Verse 4, in endurance develops strength of character. And character strengthens our confident hope of salvation. See, that's the, the strengthening. Some people are so trusting. They just trust everybody. Not in South Florida. Nobody trusts anybody in South Florida. <laughs> like, hi, how you doing? What do you want? What are you talking about, man? What do we come at me, bro? I'm like, look, I said, I said hello. Just relax. Everybody just back down. Calm down. Why are you so inflamed, man? Right? You know? But this is like, there's something about, I mean, I, I, I try to give people the benefit of the doubt. No, I'm not just handing them my wallet, right? That's not a good idea. We try to trust people and let them develop, but there's nothing. Nothing, nothing like a good friend whose character has been tried and he's been found true. You know they've got your back. You know that, hey, man, I've got a flat tire, the side of the highway. Nobody wants to come and help you, but they will be there. They will, they will get there in the traffic going by 180 miles an hour. Bumper to bumper. <laughs> and they will be there with you. They will bail you out. They will move your house for the fifth time. Those are these type of people. Their character is true. It's tried. That's what he's talking about here. That this character is strengthened. Our confident hope of salvation becomes real. I'm a, I'm a sinner. 
I need Jesus, right? And the love that comes through this is so real that there's a hope of salvation that one day he's coming back and I don't have to fight the fight anymore. That I can just live in the presence of God. But salvation is, is promised to those who believe. And theologians will argue that this is the day when he actually comes back. King of kings, Lord of lords written on his thigh. Sky splits, trumpet sounds. Ah, it's a day of salvation. Going to be a wonderful day. What a day of rejoicing that will be, right? When we all get to heaven. That's going to be a wonderful. But what about, what about today? String for today. Right, hope for tomorrow. Salvation for today. Today is this, the day of salvation. Today's the day that I move forward. First Peter 1 Peter 1.3 said, Blessed, blessed be the, the God of the Father of Lord Jesus Christ, who by his great mercy caused us to be born again to a living hope. I mean, it's, it's doing, it, 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 ha it happened in your life. See, the spirit blows, the spirit rains down on your life. And what once was dry, cracked ground, it wasn't good, nothing was going to work. Somebody could throw some seed there, but it just wasn't working because it was sitting right on top. But something came along and it began to churn up the soil. It began to till up the ground in you. And you got a little rain from the Holy Spirit. And somebody threw a seed, right? And that seed had everything that it needed. And it got the rain of the Holy Spirit in your life. And it took root in this, uh, in this churned up ground. And it stuck and it began to grow. Stop there. And we got a little three inch sprout. No, you grow. You continue to grow. Verse 5 says in this hope will not lead to disappointment. This thing growing inside of you will not lead to disappointment. For we know how dearly God loves us because he has given us the Holy Spirit to fill our hearts with his love. Paul gets kind of a bad reputation as being a pretty straightforward guy. It's like he would verbally smack some people sometimes. But Paul talks a lot about the love of God. He talks a lot about it. We should talk a lot about, I should never preach a message that doesn't mention the love of God. I mean, he, he goes in some different directions sometimes, but I love that he says hope doesn't disappoint here, right? For we know how dearly God loves us. Maybe you feel like garbage this week. Maybe you feel like nobody loves you. I try to stop every once in a while and just say, I love you. I love you. And you're like, you don't even know me. How is that even possible? It's, it's possible because God loves me. I've experienced his love, and so that I can love you. I might not know you. I love the people out there. Do I always get it right every single time? No, but I'm working on it. He's getting better than me. But the apostle goes here, and he's talking about this, that this, this specific Christian hope, this is not just humans in general. Because once again, back to the beginning, if we're left to ourselves as humans, we'll just be in a mess. Our hope will be in an iPhone or a car or a boat, Right? You ever notice that people talk about joy and peace so much in this season? We talk about it a lot in church anyway. You know how we say that peace of God, right? Isn't it interesting that nobody ever said the peace of new house? Nobody ever said, oh, this is, I've got the peace of boat. <laughs> I've got the peace of bank account in my life. Nobody says that. Even the people that, that, that don't really know God, but I got the peace of God in my life. The peace that passes all understanding. It's real and this, this hope begins, this, this feeling of expectation and the desire for certain things to happen. Not my things, not my plan, but God's plan in my life. See, that's the difference between my hope and the whole things that I hope for and the things that God wants to do through my life. Changes, it shifts, things look different. Dr. Tony Evans said this, he said, we have lasting hope through the salvation we have in Christ. Hope means that even when it looks like it's all over, it's not all over yet. That's why the Bible says we can rejoice even in our tribulation. God is working in our hard times to produce proven character and hope in us. I don't want to just want to like, okay, hope. I don't want just like a little bit, like just a little bit of belief. I want to fully believe that God is going to do something, that we would live in hope, that we will one day see our Lord face to face. But until then, I'm going to live in his presence, and I'm going to sing every day. God, show me your glory. Show me something different. And when we begin to wait and actually push in this time, then there's no better time than right now. Why would we wait? 
I wonder about all the people who, who came in here today who are like just kind of like, Ugh. every year I say I'm not going to survive Christmas, I'm going to thrive. And then the season gets here, and it's trees, and it's women's brunch, and it's men's breakfast, and it's this, and it's that, and it's here, and it's there, and we got meals, and plans, and boom, and boom, and then and I get just tired. Anybody tired? It's okay to be tired, and these things are good things, as my friend Stephen Rueda said this morning, it's okay to do good things as long as they're God things, but the stuff that is not aligned with what he wants in my life really needs to go. And if you're tired because of all of that stuff, or because you felt the stress and the weight of the world and the things that pulled you down, you need to let those things go. God's a God of freedom. He's a God of hope. Psalm 33, 22 says this, let your unfailing love surround us, O Lord, for our hope is in you alone. There's no other anchor for your soul than the hope of Jesus Christ. There's going to be a lot of stuff that's going to make this promise. There's going to be things that come your way today that you're like, oh, that's it. That's the thing that I've been waiting for. This week, some, someone's just going to knock on your door. And it's going to be, pulling. if I could just, yep, that's it, that's, that's it. And maybe that's part of God's plan for you. I'm not saying anything against that. I'm just saying don't put your hope in stuff. Stand with me in this place, please. 1 Corinthians 15, 19 says this. Paul writing again to the church at Corinth, he says, And if our hope is in, in Christ is only for this life, then we are more to be pitied than anyone in the world. What I love about this hope is it carries us into eternity. And if you love worshiping here on Sunday or you like worshiping the Lord any day, then you're going to love heaven because that's what you're going to spend eternity doing. Hope isn't just for today. It's for every day. It's for eternity. And we'll get to spend looking at the creator, the one who took mud, shaped it, and breathed life into it. That's incredible. The one who keeps all this going, as I said a few minutes ago, and looks down and sees you right where you're at and all of your craziness and all the things that you've got mixed up and, and, and put your hope in. And he says, I still want you. I just want you. I don't need you to do anything. I just need you to be with me. And we come and we sing songs. I just want to be where you are. Well, he's here. And he's there. He's in your car. He's in your shower. And he just wants you to recognize that and be with him more we stop and we recognize that he's with us, the more hope we'll be filled with. It's a beautiful, beautiful thing when you see people with hope. And I've seen some people with a lot of stuff in life who are miserable and hopeless. And I've seen people with almost nothing but filled with hope. Gilbert Beacon said, other men see only hopeless end, but Christian, and I will say the disciple rejoices in an endless hope. Hopelessness is a real feeling, isn't it? But you don't have to keep living like that. Hopeless is an attack on, on the plan of God in your life, but God specializes in filling people with hope. There's a, there's a spot that theologians call the heartfelt cry. It's when you're broken. You're just broken heart is broken, your mind is broken, you're tired, you're like, I am done. It's the heartfelt cry. God specializes in that moment when he grabs your broken heart. The Lord, the Bible tells us that the Lord is close to the brokenhearted. Maybe that's you today. Maybe you came in here with little to no hope. Maybe you have some hope, but you want more hope. Maybe you, you, don't, you don't quite have the boldness that you need to share this hope. We're going to pray for all that today. Would you bow your heads with me? Father, I thank you for your presence. I thank you for your word. I thank you for making us right. 
you are our Lord and Savior. You have justified us. You made it just as if we'd never sinned. We understand a little bit deeper the responsibility that comes with that today. Not that it's just this event that happens on Sunday, but you have called us into a place of holiness, to live in righteousness, be holy and do righteous. God, help, help us. We need your help with that. I'm so thankful that it doesn't stop there. The hope stirs inside of us today, but it gets bigger tomorrow and bigger next week. And one day you're going to come back and get us. But until then, God, I pray that our minds are fixed on you, that we are set on you, the things above, the things of heaven, the things that you have called us to. Maybe you came in here today and you're just running low on hope. I'm glad you're here. Nobody's looking around. If that's you and you say, I, I, need, I need some hope in my life. I need Jesus in my life. Would you just slip up your hand? Thank you. God sees you. You can put them down. Just pray this prayer. Say, Jesus, I need you. God, I don't have a bunch of fancy words, but I need you. I need you to intervene. I need you to fix my broken heart again. I need you to fill me with your Holy Spirit. I need you to fix my broken relationships. I need your guidance, God. I need your comfort. I need your touch again, Lord. I believe that you set the stars and the planets in motion. And I believe the same about my life, that you have called me for something bigger than I can ever imagine. alive inside of us today. Lord, thank you for touching lives. Thank you for touching our church. I love that you're not done with us, that you're moving in a mighty way. God, I pray that you would continue to sweep through Homestead, that every single person in this room will leave different because of you today. Changed by the power of your love. Fill them, guide them, direct them, strengthen them. Let them be great dispensers of hope in our community. We love you, Lord. Thank you for being with us today and every day. I know you said it wouldn't always be easy and that we would have trouble sometimes, but we hold on to the promise that you will never leave us or forsake us. It's a great promise. Thank you for always coming through. We love you. We honor and bless you. In Jesus' wonderful name, amen and amen. Can we put our hands together for the word of God? Hang on tight. Well, to be dismissed in just a second, let me tell you how much I love you guys. I'm praying for you. I'm proud of you. You guys continue to bring people. Our church is growing. We're dreaming. <laughs> when you guys are here every week, it helps us to plan and to dream uh, properly. So just dream with us. Pray for us. Pray for me. If you don't have anything to pray for, I need it. And uh, go buy a tree. Ladies, sign up for the brunch. It's coming soon. And uh, in fact, this Saturday, it's going to be a wonderful time. I'm going to be here just to hang out, just to eat some of the pastries and stuff. That's part of my call, my duty as pastor of this church is to sample everything for quality control. We love you guys so much. We're excited for this series. It's going to continue. Bring somebody with you. Like we like to say around here, each one bring one. Let's pray our benediction together. Father, let the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable in thy sight. Oh, Lord, my strength and my redeemer. God bless you, Life Point. Hey, guys, I want to thank you for joining us today. I pray that the message was encouraging, inspiring, and challenging. There's a couple of things that I want to ask you to do. One is to subscribe to our YouTube channel for all the new content that comes out weekly. The second is to help us to continue the ministry to the people of South Florida. And you can do that by clicking the Give button below. We are so glad that you came by once again. We look forward to seeing you soon. Grace and peace.